This is our connectivity panel, moderated by Luigi Scatea from PwC. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much. Um, so it's a pleasure for me today to be here to uh, discuss uh, connectivity and particularly the main trends and challenges arising in the, in the sector. Uh, so we have had uh, an interesting year with all that uh, has happened with the health crisis and everything, and this has created a number of uh, um, interesting dynamics that have impacted uh, the space sector in, uh, in multiple ways. But when you look at the connectivity sector, uh, they might have created uh, some opportunities as well, since uh, um, it looks like the crisis has uh, uh, shown the need for increased uh, connectivity services and satellite uh, uh, services might uh, provide what, uh, what is needed to achieve that. So uh, today we have a very, very interesting panel composed uh, by uh, um, uh, distinguished representatives of the industry and uh, government. So I'm sure we will have a chance to uh, uh, have the, the, the full picture on the, the main trends and challenges on connectivity uh, today. Um, I just want to start by uh, asking uh, all the panelists uh, um, to in introduce themselves and then answer one specific first question, which is how do you see the crisis, the health crisis, uh, the COVID health crisis uh, impacting the, the satellite domain from the point of view of uh, satellite communication? Did you see, uh, do you see uh, like the crisis driving the demand for connectivity services and thus creating opportunities for the satellite industry. So I'm going to start with uh, um, Khalid Al-Awadi, is the Director of Space Missions at the UAE Space Agency. Please, uh, Khalid. Thank you, Luigi, and um, um, hello, everyone. Um, so let me answer uh, this question from a space missions perspective first. Um, while, while governments implemented uh, these lockdowns in an effort to control the spread of the virus, these past few months revealed how resilient and versatile all of us as humans can be. Uh, despite being biologically weak against the virus, the human spirit survived strong in the amidst of the global uh, disruption to people, lives, and livelihoods. Despite all the losses, we have indeed witnessed wonderful success stories and unprecedented collaboration and coordination between individuals, teams, governments, and countries worldwide. The past few lockdown months stand as a testament to human willpower, perseverance, and strive to overcome the fears, griefs, challenges coming its way. So back to space missions, unlike many missions which were put on hold, we saw how um, many missions succeeded. For example, our MBRC colleagues, together with their uh, global partners, stood, stood strong and really pulled off a brilliant and successful launch to the Red Planet against incredible obstacles imposed by, imposed by the lockdowns sending a message of hope, not only to the region, but to the world for generations to come. There are many other examples. The Thoraya Next Generation system, even though it was planned before, it was born in these, hard, hard, born in these harsh times, along with many others. So coming back, we've experienced how remote working became a reality, not just theories or practices, we, we occasionally read about here and there. So preferences towards teleconferences were unlocked, discovering new tools and methods, which for so long were only icons on our desktops, and now quickly becoming uh, daily essentials uh, in our uh, work modes. Um, and we all know deep down inside, uh, they're here to stay, the ability to the ability of the household uh, to have multiple remote working individuals at the same time, connecting with different teams, sharing screens, conducting virtual discussions, 
uh, kids in their uh, respective uh, virtual classrooms, uh, non-stop streaming over social media platforms and online music and TV services. You know, all, all these um, are direct impacts of the lockdown which the COVID-19 has, uh, COVID has caused. And studies show that internet connectivity has increased between two to four fold uh, from what they were. Other studies estimate a peak increase of 40% of normal internet traffic, 100% increase in collaboration tools and gaming and streaming traffic increased by 50%. So uh, I, I, I would like to quote from a report issued by uh, IFC, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, perhaps more than any other event in human history, has demonstrated the critical importance that telecommunications infrastructure plays in keeping businesses, governments, and societies connected and running. Because of the economic and social disruption caused by the pandemic, people across the globe rely on technology for information, for social distancing, and for working from home. So with that, I um, leave the floor to my colleagues to um, comment and complete. Thank you so much, Khalid. I think that was a brilliant uh, uh, summary of uh, uh, exactly what happened during the, the lockdown and the main, uh, the main impact, uh, societal impacts that has brought uh, changing the way we work and so on. And I also I have to say that the, the successes of the UAE Space Agency during that period have been an inspiration for everyone, even for us, uh, while uh, uh, we were following that from home. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so moving on, uh, uh, we have now uh, uh, Bulend Altan. He's the uh, CEO of Minarik, an interesting, quite interesting company. So I think, uh, um, Bulan, I think it would be very nice uh, for you to introduce a little bit your company because uh, what you do is quite, uh, um, uh, quite interesting and, uh, and exciting. And um, then you can provide your view. So what do you think this... Uh, this disruption uh, mean for uh, for the industry and particularly for uh, for your company for the solution that you're bringing to the market. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, um, I, as you mentioned, I'm the CEO of Mineric, a, a German uh, a German company. We are a, a supplier to the uh, satellite industry, specifically the uh, the um, uh, low Earth orbit satellite constellations, but also the air, um, the aviation industry as well. What we build is uh, laser communication terminals that allow satellites and uh, airplanes and other airborne nodes con communicate with each other. And as our target market is in the low Earth orbit constellation world, I, have, uh, I think we have seen quite a bit of dynamicism yeah, over the last year. I think if there was any skepticism about the need for an adaptive, completely world encompassing, uh, high quality uh, connectivity services that is complementary to all the services that we have today, I think COVID-19 has proven this to be uh, to, to be right that we need that, that the need is there as um, already mentioned the connectivity uh, needs of the world has increased many fold I think uh, uh, streaming services have seen their customer base explode I think Disney already has said that their customer base has tripled in just the course of a month so people are looking for connectivity services and others to do to do the, our their everyday work. And I think with that, we see our customer base, which is, I think, twofold, which is both in the commercial and in the governmental connectivity, get more and more attention to the uh, ever-increasing Leo connectivity market uh, thought. And uh, with also the uh, pace given by SpaceX Starlink, I think we are seeing a uh, focus on this connectivity. I think the, the challenge of connecting everyone in a homogeneous way, in a ubiquitous way, is going to become more and more prevalent as the result of COVID-19. I think our current terrestrial structures were very well built to serve the idea of mega cities. Uh, the fiber and copper connectivity uh, has the utmost quality when you go into the middle of New York, LA, or, uh, or uh, Abu Dhabi, or wherever you may be in a large city but the quality decreases quite rapidly once you are further and further distance from the city center. And I think in the IoT and the rural or sub-suburban areas, they are at this point non-existent or really low. 
Yet COVID-19 showed that there is actually a reverse migration exactly into those geographies. And there is a challenge to exactly connect these people at the places they want to live now. They don't, um, I think if you look here in the US, San Francisco is, uh, and New York are seeing a reverse migration to other areas uh, as people are even moving in with their parents um, just to kind of keep the impact low. And these are places in certain cases that don't have the connectivity solution. So the need for connectivity in tougher and less dense geographic locations is going up. With that, uh, we are seeing an increase in the thought that uh, low Earth orbits together with its counterparts in terrestrial, but also in higher orbits, uh, satellite services is going to increase. We are seeing an increased demand. And with that, we are seeing an increased demand for our products and services. We see our customers customers' projects come to life and even accelerate. So uh, we have seen an incre- quite a tremendous increase in the ask for laser connectivity solutions between satellites. Excellent. That makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, indeed, the point you make about the, the reverse migration is, uh, is quite interesting because that's a trend observed uh, uh, more or less in all the developed world. I guess it can it will be interesting to see if it's a uh, if it's going to be a permanent change or a, um, or a temporary one, but for sure it seems like cities and in general human agglomeration will be more distributed and less focused. So thanks a lot. So then moving on, um, uh, the next uh, speaker uh, we have is uh, Samir uh, Alawi. He's the executive uh, uh, vice president and chief commercial officer at Intelsat. Um, so I guess we can uh, we can have uh, uh, the point of view of um, of an operator as well here so maybe uh, you could tell us also uh, what sort of uh, challenges do you see for satellite operators to respond and capitalize on this uh, uh, demand that has been uh, sort of created uh, uh, as a result of the crisis yeah well thank you for the opportunity uh, you know to, to start with i wanted to uh echo what uh, Khaled was talking about in terms of uh, access to space. And we as a company also, we have launched a satellite recently and a mission extension vehicle, which is a, a pioneering effort that, that extends the life of satellites that are already in orbit. And Khaled, I, I, uh, I'm a big believer in, in the probe that you're sending to Mars and the name Hope could not have been a better name you know, in a time like this. So it's a uh, it's, it's really touching uh, experience. Uh, in terms of, of, of COVID and what it has done, look, there, there, we're all facing some challenges in, immediate, uh, in our immediate business, you know, in, in terms of revenues and you know, the, in particular from the commercial aviation uh, business and, and that has been, you know, was down at some point, uh, the traffic was down by 95% and the cruise business is also an important market for the sector, for the satellite sector. And that was, that's a market that has been hit very hard, uh, harshly. On the flip side of this, uh, you know, our enterprise networks and the, the cellular backhaul uh, areas have, of course, required a lot more capacity for all the reasons that uh, Khaled and Bonant have, uh, have mentioned. And uh, because of that migration further away from the cities, because of that, you know, going towards the rural areas, uh, you know, there's a need for satellite because this is where satellite is, is uh you know, it's cost effective and, and makes a lot more sense than terrestrial alternatives. And there's also a lot of opportunity to take content to the edge. So it's, you know, it's, it's not enough to just bring content to, to, the, to the main markets and then try to distribute in a unicast uh, way, but uh, taking content to the edge in a multicast way is, is, a, uh, is a feature that satellite can do, that terrestrial networks cannot do. So there's a lot more opportunities that are being created. And uh, I would like to uh, devote a little bit of attention to the mobility markets and in particular commercial aviation, because commercial aviation, that sector has been underserved by satellite for the last few years and has been served by a business model that has proven uh, unsuccessful. So there's a service provision uh, or provider layer that has not been successful at, at, uh, at offering services of quality that is good enough uh, to generate the take rates uh, on airplanes that we think are, you know, we think should, should be the case. Uh, and as a result, there's been a lot of inefficiency and, uh, and, and the economics have not worked and it has not created the right demand. Uh, 
uh, I think with, with COVID right now, there's this, this market is going to change. And we as a company have taken the opportunity to go fully vertical uh, in this market. And we have recently announced the acquisition of GoGo, which is a service provider, the number one service provider of uh, uh, in-flight connectivity. And the idea is to marry the capabilities of a satellite operator and the owner economics of a satellite operator with the retail and operational capabilities of a service provider, and then change the whole dynamics of the IFC ecosystem. And this is gonna be very important when people start flying again, and they are used to now uh, capabilities that uh, they have in their living room and at home. Uh, people need to be able to connect on Zoom on an airplane. They will need that in a hybrid world coming up. They will need to have access to Netflix, to corporate uh, accounts and all of that. So we're looking at ways to uh, dramatically change the passenger experience on board airplanes at uh, economics that have never seen before. That, that's a very interesting perspective. So um, the, the aeroconnectivity is still like going to be a significant market in the future as indeed, as you say, uh, people getting used to uh, uh, higher connectivity levels as a result of this crisis will want to maintain that. Uh, when they're traveling, so that uh, that makes sense. Um, so then uh, we can um, close this first round with uh, um, John Peterson, is the Vice President of Connectivity and Services at uh, Honeywell uh, Connected Enterprise. Um, so along the same lines of all the other speakers, uh, maybe we can also get from you like a sense of what are the, the um, let's say the if any, what are some technology advancements that will be needed in order to capture uh, and increase the demand for connectivity? Hey, Luigi, thank you very much. Again, thanks for the opportunity to talk. You know, before I kind of dive into it, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Awadi for his answer, uh, to talk about the human element of what's going on and to talk about the perseverance to overcome this stuff. You know, it's businessmen looking at P&Ls and trying to figure out how to deliver a quarter. I really appreciate where you went with that. So thanks for that. It gave me a little bit of pause and I took some notes. Um, to talk specifically about the air transport industry and what's going on. Um, from my perspective, I really see COVID being the much needed purge that the air transport industry needed. We were, um, were, were grossly under capacity. So COVID showed that there's not even close to enough capacity in the world for the overall needs and the, and the consumer experience that needs to be delivered, whether it's, whether it's in your home or your office or what have you. Uh, COVID has really showed that despite the, the unbelievable amount of money put into team, put into Zoom and put into these things, you know, overall, you get a pretty crappy experience because the video drops off, the voice can't be heard, people can't get on, servers get, get congested. So, and you look at what the capacity is in the ground, the, the capacity from space today is, is pretty pathetic. And the biggest problem that we have with capture rates is the fact that there's just no capacity. And, so, and the cost is obscene. And so there's a squeeze. The people who are providing the services can't buy the services cheap enough because there's not enough capacity to get the passenger experience to drive the capture rates. So the, the whole aerospace industry is just one great big chokehold on what people really want, which is just to get on the internet and do what they do. Um, and so we try to offset these things by jacking the price up real high to keep the capture rates low in order to have the capacity so the passenger can have a passable experience. So someone like me can do email and be on team and I am my office and stay connected and that doesn't drop off. And so that's how we've been balancing this thing. And so tying this back to COVID, what we really see is the much needed consolidation. And um, Samar uh, spoke to that. He spoke to how they're taking advantage, how his company is looking at this opportunity and looking at where our industry's got some devaluations, jumping onto that, creating a vertical. The other piece that Honeywell is really looking at is the, um, 
with five, coincidentally, 5G is rolling out. And coincidentally, 5G is going to over congest the high population areas. And coincidentally, LEO, MEO, and higher capacity satellites are gonna to go to space, which creates a very low cost, very high data rate, very low latency capacity opportunity that has never existed in our industry. And this is a pretty amazing thing. And then you take a look at the fact that, you know, satellites have gone from tens of thousands of dollars a kilo to put into orbit to thousands of dollars a kilo to put into an orbit. That's another exponential difference that's gonna to contribute to this. And then you take a look at the number of people that are investing in ground infrastructure in order to link these things together, which makes my fixed costs on network a fraction of what they used to be because I don't have to set up pops all over the world. I can just plug into one and get there. What we're doing and what we see that's coming out of COVID is airlines need to be able to make a choice. So today, if my self, if my internet provider in my house or my mobile phone or my, if, that, if I don't like them, that's a phone call away. I pick up the phone, I make a phone call. An hour later, I got another provider. I'm gonna get a better experience, whatever defines my experience. Today, airlines are stuck. They make a $700,000 capital investment. They put an aircraft into service for five to 15 years, and, and it costs seven, more than $700,000 to switch service providers per airframe. That's a bad deal. It's always been a bad deal for the airline industry. Honeywell wants to eliminate that barrier. What we wanna do is tell airlines, put a platform on the aircraft, swap the SIM card, swap the modem, make it really, really easy for an airline to make investments today, get onto a platform, take advantage of the capacity of the future. That's really where Honeywell is focused. We're a technology leader in KA technologies, we're a technology leader in terms of business aviation, air transport and defense. And coming out of COVID gave us a pause to take a look at the industry, take a look at what's going on in 5G, take a look at what the satellite capacity providers are bringing to market, and you know, we're meshing satellites now, so global coverage is much easier now than it ever was in the past, because now you can have Leo Mio, you can mesh them, you can drop that traffic anywhere you want to, you can secure that traffic any way you want to. There are so many new technologies coming out of COVID, and it's important because the airline's capital is crushed. They've got no money for the next, you pick the number of years. And so all of these things that are happening now, these technology advancements, everything that's happening now that we're doing to get greater capacity into space, to mesh these satellites, to get more efficient ground capacity, to get your pennies per megabyte down to very sub, sub, sub pennies per megabyte because of all of this other ways to use the capacity, more efficient use of the capacity. This is gonna set airlines up in two, three, four years from now that have commercial models they couldn't even dream of today because of the fact that the cost per megabyte is just too high and there's nothing that can be done about it because there's not enough capacity to get the cost per megabyte down. So we're so coming out of COVID, I think we're in the best position we've ever been in to actually do something more for the aerospace industry. Fantastic. That's a, that's a brilliant overview and that makes a lot of sense. Um, I also like your uh, optimism on the, on how easy it is to change a phone operator. <laughs> I can tell you that here in France it's not that easy. <laughs> yeah, it's a very American view of things. Exactly. Here we have a, we have a saying, you know, when you, want to, when you want to insult someone, you say you're worse than the phone company. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I think it makes a lot of sense, and uh, you touched on a number of points that are uh, that are quite interesting. So you're basically uh, discussing, you know, the fact that there will be more more capacity available in the future thanks to uh, to mega constellation projects uh, of different sorts. So maybe the next next question to the panel will be uh, taken up from this is. Uh, so what do you think are the main challenges associated to the deployment of those uh, mega constellations? Because in the end, I mean, we see many of them, um, but uh, I guess we can say that 
as of today, the operational and business model is not yet, uh, uh, you know, fully proven somehow. So uh, um, if you had to, to single out in your view some uh, challenges that you see for those uh, projects to actually come to full fruition and, uh, and deliver on all their promises, what would uh, those challenges uh, to be overcome? What, what, uh, what do you think that those would be? I don't know who wants to, so, to pick it up, maybe. So maybe I, I'll jump into that because I think one of the one of the main deliverables of Minerk is exactly a, uh, is, is ex exactly an answer to one of those technical challenges. Um, well, yeah, we already touched on the fact that the Leo uh, mega constellations, given their really low altitude, um, they need a meshing setup to be really effective, or else the uh, ground uh, the ground infrastructure needed to run a mega constellation gets uh, almost uh, unattainable. So we really to give the capability, uh, deploy the capacity, but also be able to offer low latency requires a complete mesh network to leave the earth and actually go into space. So meshing is going to become the challenge of that challenge to solve. And that's what we have built Mineric around. I think um, laser communication has been around in the industry for quite some time now. And, uh, um, and it has been used mostly for institutional purposes, carrying a a price tag that was not attainable by anyone who wants to build a network and uh, uh, offer cost-effective solutions. So what we are doing today is uh, working on cost-effective solutions that you can deploy not one, but four, five, six, uh, whatever, uh, whatever your network topology is, laser communication terminals on these uh, LEO satellites and have a true mesh network in the sky and you can route traffic efficiently because we know we're going to need to route traffic quite long distances especially in the airline industry and we want we don't want to do that by just dropping ground stations everywhere and in certain cases in places that where ground stations cannot be attainable so with that uh, laser com is going to become the big issue and we don't want to uh, be uh, we don't we want to make sure that that solution is solved in an economic fashion because no one wants to pay uh, uh, the, the current rates which is just not working um, what's also in going to be important is keeping whatever infrastructure we put into space to be as adaptable as possible. We saw with COVID that, that the assumptions that we make in the business cases can be thrown into the wind really fast, like reverse migration, like the type of, the type of traffic, like wherever that, uh, that traffic, whatever is the traffic's um, uh, segmentation, like it goes from aircraft to rural connectivity in the, just like an instance of a, an instance of COVID-19. We have to be adaptable and therefore you need the adaptable services to go along with it. So you can't make static setups. You have to make dynamic setups. Um, I think Leo mega constellations probably are more open to that given the fact that they themselves of the physical parameters are more dynamic. They are constantly moving. The connectivity is much more smeared uh, um, equally around the world. Uh, uh, rather than uh, direct fixed uh, geostationary satellites, which is more targeted capacity. So I think we will see uh, we will see the two work together closely. But again, um, it needs a couple of technology solutions, which are I think either end the time of breakthrough. I think we are already uh, deploy uh, delivering the first uh, first uh, laser com terminals, or they are about to be done. Yeah. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Thanks a lot, uh, Bulan. And just from uh, from the point of view of the, 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 the um, end delivery to the user, so to the user terminal, um, do, you, do you see any uh, specific challenge associated with user terminals? Because in the end, I mean, when you have to serve uh, like uh, remote regions, you need to find a way for, for people over there to quickly uh, be able to have the, the, the solution deployed to them. Um, so do you think uh, uh, this is again to the panel? I don't know if, if John or uh, Samir wants uh, to yeah, take let me, Yeah, let me, jump, let me jump in with you. I think, look, uh, the constellations technically will work. It's, the, you know, it's, not a, it's not a very difficult thing to make them work. Uh, the, the, I think the antennas is probably, on the, from a technical challenge, that's probably one of the most, uh, or the biggest uh, issues to be able to overcome. And... Uh, I mean, you'll have antennas that work, but you, don't have, you will not have antennas that will work very efficiently or that are cheap enough that will open up uh, multiple markets for those constellations as such. You know, that will restrict the, 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 the return that they're going to get on their investment. 
And uh, so it becomes more of a financial uh, uh, problem, uh, especially that those constellations, because they have a short life, they need a very fast revenue ramp up, uh, which you know, they will struggle with. Uh, so I think, I think they bring something good to this world, you know, especially in terms of latency, but they can work very well in conjunction with other uh, capabilities. And now you're, you know, you're talking Geo, Mio, Leo, and even HAPS uh, at, that's at, a, at a much lower uh, okay. altitude. But I think it's important to also understand what's happening on the geo side, because the geo side is not, is not the old uh, geo anymore. You know, there's, there's a new geo phase coming up right now, which is a software defined satellites that are, first of all, it takes half of the time to manufacture those uh, uh, than before. And uh, those are satellites that are fully configurable in orbit and they have the capability for an uh, aeronautical market, for example, in particular, they have the capability of having beams that are tracking individual planes at all times. And you can change the capacity. It's extremely powerful and very, uh, very adaptable. And, uh, you know, of course, because of that focused nature, you can put them where there's revenue uh, generation. And it makes more sense than to invest in that uh, capability and in those uh, megabits that, that John is talking about would like to see at a, at a much cheaper rate for the airlines for the take rates to go up. So, you know, it's, it's not just a matter of, of, of supply, but it's also the business model, how we deploy that supply and how efficient you get it in the hands of the customer uh, on, on the airline or, or elsewhere. So th that's very important. That's why the vertical integration in a commercial aviation world is important because that capacity was just sitting idle with service providers where it could be utilized in a much more dynamic way. So there's no more need to have uh, inventory because the satellite operator is deploying that capacity. Uh, and, you know, we're looking forward to a world where the take rates are going to be much higher, the quality is going to be much higher, and that will stimulate the demand, which will stimulate the satellite operators to invest more in dedicated mm -hmm. capacity for that network. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you coherently see like a capacity increase and, uh, and capacity prices uh, uh, going down uh, coherently? I do. I think, I think, first of all, access to space is becoming cheaper. So that's helping in terms of pricing. Uh, the manufacturing uh, standards or the, or the, the software defined satellites are now generating a standard on the, on the satellite manufacturing world. So instead of the satellite operators having custom satellites that are built just for them that take two years to build, now they're buying a, a standard satellite that looks like what our competitors uh, have, and it takes half the time. So that will make the satellites uh, cheaper, obviously, so the capacity becomes cheaper. But it's the efficiency in the business model and how you distribute and how you get to the end customer that will generate the most value. And that's mm -hmm. how, you know, you'll be able to uh, switch, like John said, you know, you switch from companies. Uh, our goal is, obviously, from, from, from our point of view, you know, we have an open architecture so that the uh, capacity on the airline is available through multiple suppliers. So the antenna on, on, the, on the plane, you know, we work with Gogo and the, the 2KU antenna that Gogo has, uh, and our network architecture allows for multiple satellite operators to feed capacity into that uh, network. So it's not just one supplier and one capacity, but it's multiple suppliers, multiple satellites. Mm -hmm. And with that, you get the resiliency and you get the redundancy uh, and you get the coverage and you get the density of coverage. And, and also, of course, the coverage of the hub cities, which is becoming more and more important for, for uh, commercial uh, uh, airlines. So that, we believe, is, is going to be the, the trick to, to unlocking the economics and to growing that market. Okay. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, clearly, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, a business model, uh, it's a business model issue to be cracked. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how... Uh, how that evolves market-wise uh, with all the with all the various players, because there's going to be a need also for some uh, for several partnerships and uh, and new partnership models. I would assume. Um, just maybe switching uh, gear a little bit, I wanted to go back to uh, to Khalid for um, for a question that is more related to uh, on the government from the government perspective. So we see. Um, uh, I mean, of course, it, it was always there, but we see particularly even now like an interest in uh, from many governments to basically secure uh, sovereign, uh, um, secure uh, satellite communication capabilities uh, at governmental level. 
Um, is that something uh, that uh, the, the UAE is also looking at or planning, or is this is this something that uh, that uh, the UAE sees as a strategic for the country? Well, uh, thank you for this question, Luigi. And in, in my opinion, and also touching um, uh, on a, a lot of points from my colleagues uh, in their uh, discussion. Uh, telecoms will always be a, a vital sector uh, and a vital service uh, for a lot of uh, applications. And uh, you know, the question of uh, sovereignty will always be there, in my personal opinion. Now, um, with with the COVID, like like the workplace, which has evolved, and again, in my opinion, will never be the same. Uh, I suspect that the way the industry will start providing services um, will will evolve as well, and uh, and especially in the way um, business is conducted. So um, there will have to be definitely new and innovative business models, as that was um, uh, discussed by uh, my colleagues, and uh, more uh, levels of collaboration and risk sharing in those missions. Uh, for example, if we take um, the satellite constellations, uh, it comes with uh, cert certainly very good features, but um, there are challenges as well. And um, with the COVID-19 situation, the economy is going down, slowing down, and everyone is becoming capex sensitive nowadays. And, you know, a certain thought and direction of thought is, more towards how we can join forces to create a certain, uh, let's say, infrastructure that will benefit everyone. And I believe this is the direction of the future when, um, when we talk about huge telecom systems, whether they are, uh, you know, highly advanced and uh, um, adaptable uh, geostationary or uh, constellations at uh, the Leo or Mio uh, orbits. So, um, yeah. investing in new technologies will be also important, uh, which will, in, in a way, which will ensure robustness and tactical uh, scalability of services, uh, and also capitalizing on the lessons learned uh, while gaining uh, a more profound understanding of the dynamics and requirements um, of connectivity and adapting the existing systems uh, to consumer demands will be of key importance and uh, um, drawing a lot of um, um, uh, points that we can build up on. So the way of the future, just in my humble opinion, will be more collaborations um, and um, uh, an innovative business model um, where um, the risk level of each of the missions will be um, lowered by sharing across uh, a lot of um, uh, partners, let's say. That makes a lot of sense. I think that's a very good overview on where the future should be added. And I think we... Um, we can't uh, close with a better uh, uh, with a better overview. So we are at the end of this uh, session, and I think it was a very very interesting and exhaustive uh, discussion on uh, on the future of connectivity and uh, and the potential uh, uh, moving forward of satellite services in in providing connectivity. So we touched different points, um, and we had the view of. Um, of satellite operations, technology development, and uh, 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 satellite uh, assets deployments. So that's, uh, uh, that was absolutely brilliant. So I want to thank uh, the panelists for, uh, for their contribution today. That was uh, very, very good. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to, uh, to have you in the panel today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, as well. Thank you from my side. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.
Okay, so I'm here with Jasim Nasser, Chief Strategy and Marketing Officer for Taraya. Jasim, if I could ask you please to, to introduce yourself to our audience. Sure. Uh, my name is Jasim Nasser. I'm the Chief uh, Strategy and Marketing Officer, like you mentioned. It. Uh, I've been working with Taraya for now uh, 22 years, uh, and uh, I'm responsible for uh, Taraya's strategy development, business development activities, uh, including uh, product management and uh, market development uh, too. Thank you. Um, so, just how how do you have you found that the experience of the COVID nineteen pandemic has driven demand for connectivity services from uh, from satellite platforms like yours? Sure. So, uh, certainly, the the usual market segments for for Satcom, uh, aeronautical and maritime have have been affected negatively due to the uh, pandemic. For example, some of the operators providers uh, are re are rethinking their uh, IFC plans uh, as connectivity demand has gone down. However, in other market segments, uh, demand for connectivity has increased uh, and new applications and uh, requirements uh, have emerged. So COVID-19 highlighted the digital divide issue and made it uh, visible on a larger scale, I would say. This is now driving governments and international community uh, to leave no one behind. So when, when I look at the pandemic, I see connectivity requirements uh, from uh, three user types. Uh, the first one would be those who have requirements, whose requirements have emerged due to the uh, movement restrictions of so work from home and online learning, as you know. Uh, as an example, this has led to ur uh, urgent requirement for cost-effective uh, mobile backhauling over satellite to relieve congestion in terrestrial networks. Uh, another example is support needed for e-learning applications and video conferencing. So satellite operators like Yasat, for example, are adding secondary paths at base stations so that voice and signaling can be routed over highly uh, high availability terrestrial or C uh, KU uh, band routes while the packet service uh, runs over uh, HTS. Now, that was the first type of customer, I would say, or segment. The second category is the customers who are combating the, the pandemic in the front lines, including NGOs. Many governments rely on use of smartphone applications today to implement their measures, and these feed directly into uh, centralized uh, data centers. SATCOM supports and enables use of the same applications in remote areas. For a, real, uh, a good example would be, uh, which is relevant to Thraya, is connecting ambulances in the UAE uh, with satellite devices, the Thraya X5 Touch, to help medical staff uh, limit the number of the growing number of corona virus cases. The third category is driven by operational efficiency. Now, uh, this is not necessarily linked with the pandemic. However, I think it, it got heightened uh, with the COVID-19 uh, situation. The general theme today is to work, monitor, manage uh, remotely and have less people uh, on the ground. Uh, think about managing a small bank branch, for example, and ATMs via SATCOM. Uh, another example would be to uh, is the use of drones and how these can be monitored and uh, managed uh, beyond line of sight. So this has given raise or surge in IoT and uh, M2M uh, requirements. I think the bottom line is that SATCOM has shown more value and bigger role in satisfying the connectivity requirements, especially when considering the large footprints or the blanket coverage and the technologically uh, agnostic uh, capabilities. So, I mean, that outlines some of the some of the areas where um, growth dem uh, demand growth has uh, has been in place. But what are the kind of specific opportunities for Thorea and the challenges that you've identified sort of through this period? Um, and how do you think you and, and other operators can best respond to to capitalise on the, this demand growth? Okay, so uh, maybe we take we take this like one by one. So let's let's try to address the challenges. So the biggest challenge today is the overall uh, macro situation due to the COVID-19. Uh, the impact has been varying across different industries. Fortunately, the SADCOM industry seems to, have to, seems to be less impacted when compared with others. For SADCOM and NASA specifically, I would say the main challenges that surfaced during the pandemic are, one is the logistics to provide users and customers with SADCOM equipment and solutions in the field and support them technically. Uh, with those solutions. With the lockdown and the restrictions, 
this was quite difficult at times, when, especially when you see demand for connectivity increasing and the need for SATCOM solutions and applications uh, raising. The second challenge I would say is the impact of COVID-19 on the supply chain and the ecosystem uh, availability. You know, each country had and still has its like its own uh, lockdown rules and regulations, and we are, we rely on vendors in different parts of the world. Uh, so, to some extent, this has I would say disrupted at sometimes uh, the the supply chain uh, process. Uh, last, I would say, in terms of challenges, would be the price elasticity and stability, uh, especially when it comes uh, to convergence between SATCOM and terrestrial uh, services. You know, users in the terrestrial uh, users of terrestrial services, when they when they use satellite services, they would expect the same sort of uh, uh, pricing, uh, and and that 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 uh, that was a challenge, I think, uh, during the pandemic. Now, that said. Certainly, the slowdown in supply growth delay of certain space programs, I would say, has helped the market to regain uh, a certain degree of equilibrium, uh, aided with the demand growth in certain uh, in some verticals. On the opportunity side, I would say, in general, opportunities seems to uh, revolve around uh, broadband, uh, consumer broadband, uh, IoT, and sovereign uh, government requirements. Uh, when we dig deeper, uh, we see existing applications getting amplified or emergence of new applications. Examples would be, like I mentioned, online learning, uh, video conferencing, telemedicine, online healthcare, and remote consultations, the industrial IoT as part of the operational efficiency uh, theme, I would say, uh, applications relevant to the energy sector, the banking sector, um, and then safety and security. So, the, for example, would be the monitoring of roads and, and traffic. Uh, the user experience uh, from terrestrial services uh, has driven increase in convergence model between SATCOM and terrestrial. And this has also led to new requirements for interoperability uh, between the two uh, technologies, I would say. Uh, I think the last part was about uh, how to capitalize uh, yes. on the opportunities, right? So. Maybe we address them from from uh, on two fronts. One is internal, and the and the second one is is, uh, is external. I would say, uh, internally, we need to benefit and capitalize on innovation and initiatives which were adopted across the board, uh, such as uh, efficient processes, digitalization, and others. Now we had to deal with the lockdown and moving restrictions ourselves, so we had to innovate. We had to improvise. Uh, and we manage this in a, in a good way, I would say. A lot of the governmental uh, departments and private sector organizations around the world are going to continue with these new working models uh, for a long term and embrace them as business as usual. And I think that's, that's one thing that can be capitalized upon. Externally and more relevant to us, I would say also would be one is that we should continue to work with uh, the partners and the vendors in particular, who have shown commitment, flexibility, and innovation uh, during the pandemic. Uh, also, then extending these learnings uh, to, to assist uh, other partners. Uh, we have come across development of new applications, new solutions, and these could be extended with small tweaks and modifications to adjacent verticals and, and markets, I would say. Uh, finally, I would say, Locking down customers based on long-term contra contracts, customized packages will not only help um, for preparing for any such events in the future, but it would also allow SATCOM uh, to be embedded as a default part of uh, the customer uh, solution, I would say. Excellent. Now, obviously, it's we've talked a lot about the, the impact of the COVID pandemic, but we also want to look towards the future and what happens next. And one of the things that'd be interesting to find out is, yeah, what are the technologies that you and Toy I think will be the, you know, the next wave of global connectivity? You mentioned um, satellite broadband and IoT, but, but where, where's next? What's gonna drive that, uh, that connectivity revolution? Okay, um, I think, as the power of satellite continues to bring uh, emerging technologies to consumers, uh, its ability to power uh, the internet of things, uh, blockchain, 5G, 
and other technologies will push society into the next generation of connectivity and communication. I reflect on a few of these. So IoT is, is an important part for, for SATCOM industry. And the IoT revolution is underway and causing the supply and delivery chain to go through an unparalleled uh, evolution, I would say. Uh, there has been increased level of automation across all uh, industrial uh, segments. For blockchain, I would, to, in terms of blockchain, I would say to take the digital tr uh, trust a step further, many businesses are also leveraging a blockchain as its decentralization provides a higher standard of, uh, of security. Blockchain eliminates the point of failure in an enterprise uh, technology uh, infrastructure. So using blockchain as an extra level of security for IoT ensures the technology devices we rely on today, for both for business and everyday uh, application, are secure. Uh, moving on to uh, 5G uh, and interoper interoperability or convergence with, uh, with satellite. So leveraging the intrinsic merits of uh, high altitude and the ability of multicasting broadcasting for satellite communication systems provides an opportunity for uh, uh, novel mobile communication networks with its tight interaction and complementary characteristics to traditional terrestrial networks. So but what we're talking about is here hybrid solutions, hybrid systems versus uh, standard traditional uh, terrestrial networks. Autonomous vehicles, uh, in order to achieve high and strict requirements for safety and total independence of the human element, uh, there is a definite need for highly reliable communication systems, most probably composed of hybrid technologies. Uh, with short and long range communication technologies, we can clearly see requirements for connectivity, uh, be it from uh, latency, uh, capacity, uh, throughput speed, or availability uh, perspective. Now, Obviously, by definition, satellite is a technology without borders. And one of the things we'd be interested to find out is how um, the extension of the satellite capabilities of the UAE helps support the soft power initiatives and the global outreach of the, uh, of the nation. Okay, so, so uh, the, the UAE has, uh, has a very uh, solid long-term vision for space and satellite industry. Many milestones have been achieved in the last 12 months, as you know, We've sent an astronaut to the International Space Station, commenced the HOPE mission, the first unmanned interplanetary satellite to Mars. The country is currently uh, shaping a competitive, diversified, uh, flexible knowledge-based economy that is powered by skilled Emiratis and effective partnerships between public and uh, private uh, sectors. Uh, innovation, uh, research, science, and technology constitute the framework of this highly dynamic and futuristic uh, economy. The UAE has realized the criticality and relevance to have and develop a sovereign space uh, industry, which creates extraordinary long-term value for our nation and the world. YASAT, uh, and three as part of YASAT's group, leads the UAE aspirations to be a power in the global satellite uh, industry. Today, Yasat has a fleet of five satellites, reaching more than 80% of the world population on five continents, enabling critical communications, including broadband, broadcasting, backhauling, and mobility solutions. Recently, Yasat uh, announced the plan for Thraya's next generation system, Thraya 4 NGS, which is a half a billion uh, investment uh, program. Uh, to, sh to share uh, some of the other initiatives in the country, uh, for example, Tawazun is building a satellite assembly integration and uh, testing a center with Airbus in Alain. The Hub 71 initiative, which supports parallel and complementary efforts to drive technological innovation in the overall uh, ecosystem. The, of the objective of Hub 71 is to incubate and uh, accelerate lo uh, local uh, digital and uh, technological ventures bringing up startups, uh, innovators, uh, and established industry players to work uh, together. Uh, yes, for Yasa and Taraya, we, we operate in a very unique space uh, where, uh, like you said, our vision and operations are not impeded by borders. We speak the language of international cooperation, and we actively support humanitarian missions 
through a number of international uh, agencies, such as the UN, uh, WFO, ITU, and the emergency uh, telecommunications uh, cluster. Uh, during the present crisis, we have uh, underscored our commitment to the UN and sponsored the Global Humanitarian COVID-19 Response Plan through collaborations with uh, participating uh, entities. Additionally, uh, YASAT is, is building uh, the UAE uh, soft power with a number of initiatives uh, through governments and service partners in different countries. Dedicated actions uh, include uh, prioritization of educational, healthcare, uh, business collaboration uh, applications, and making Wi-Fi hotspots available uh, to anyone who, who needs them. Jasim, thank you very much for sharing your views with us today. Congratulations on the success of the, uh, the, the programs of your organizations, um, and we wish you every success in the future. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.